Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online, find all the back episodes, and nominate new shows at rce-cast.com. You can also follow me personally on Twitter at Brock Palin, all one word. And you can also find my blog floating around off of the RCE website. I also have here again Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI and sits on the MPI3 forum body. And Jeff, you've been pretty busy recently. Ah, uh, yeah, there's always lots to do. And MPI3 is actually finishing up well it's it's starting to finish up meaning that uh all the new things that will be considered for mpi3 are now in so the doors are actually closing but it's it's a busy time it's good stuff yeah and you've been having some information about some of the, the changes to fortran and some other like tips and tricks for some, utilizing open mpi at a more detailed level over at your blog yeah. which is also linked off of the website um, also, I will be speaking at Globus World at Argonne National Lab, which is April 10th, 11th, and 12th. I'll be talking about some of the stuff we've been doing with Globus here at the University of Michigan. And Jeff, you've got Euro MPI coming up, don't you? Yeah, let me give a shout out to Euro MPI. Uh, call for papers. The papers are due in about a month. Um, May 5th is the deadline for posters and papers, and it's in Vienna this year. So beautiful Vienna, Austria. Please uh, be sure to get your papers in. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into our guests today. Uh, we have two guests. Uh, we have Matt Turk and Aaron Amadea. Uh, he, they both are authors on the MPI for Pi, uh, which is a set of MPI bindings for Python. So, guys, why don't you go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. So, my name is Aaron Amadea. I'm a research scientist at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, and uh, Primarily, I came into MPI for Pi as a user uh, since we're interested at a high level of using Python for you know parallel computing applications on supercomputers. So I uh, really we have this uh, invisible third person sitting in the room with us, uh, Alessandro Dalson, who's who's the main creator and, and developer of MPI for Pi. And so there will be a lot of Lissandro did this and Lissandro chose, and and Lissandro's genius sits beneath most of, of MPI for Pi. Uh, but, yeah, we're, we're happy to be uh, uh, part of the development team and, and helping uh, with, with MPI for Pi. Uh, I also wanted to do a quick shout-out for uh, the SciComp Stack Exchange, which is a new uh, beta. I'm, I'm moderating for that. And uh, hopefully if you have a question or answer about high-performance computing, you can uh, go check that site out. Uh, and there will be a link, I hope, from the podcast uh, page. Yeah, so uh, my name is Matt Turk, and I'm a uh, postdoc at Columbia University with the NSF CI Tracks program. And I also, like uh, Aaron, come into MPI for Pi mostly as a user. Uh, I've you know deployed it on a number of different systems inside the Exceed system and outside it uh, as a library used by a program that I run or that I wrote uh, called YT, which is used uh, in astrophysical data analysis. And, you know, I've used it, uh, MPI for Pi to interoperate with C++ code, uh, as well as, you know, strictly within Python. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, where I come at it from. Yeah, so unfortunately we did try to get Lisandro on the show, but he couldn't be here due to scheduling conflicts and time zones and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, but he said that you guys could fill in for him as a worthy representative. So why don't we go right into this? Can you give us a little bit of a, an overview of what MPI for Pi is? Uh, sure. So MPI for Pi is, uh, at the highest level, a set of bindings for uh, the MPI uh, interface from Python. So uh, it attempts to provide not only all of the MPI uh, functions at a, at a C level, where you're basically calling the C function directly just from Python, but also a friendlier set of bindings that interact uh, with generic Python objects using a, a technology in Python called Pickle, which is effectively just serialization. Now, what was the rationale for creating MPI for Pi? I mean, why add yet another set of language bindings in here? What's, what's the motivation? Uh, so I think that uh, it's it's clear that if if you want to use uh, MPI from Python, you, you can't uh, just call the C API directly. That's ugly and and dirty. And and C types wasn't even around uh, when MPI for Pi was was first written. So it's nice to have something in in the language that's uh, friendly and flexible and and easy to use and and feels like Python. So 
if you're uh, an MPI programmer, of course, and you've been writing in C and Fortran, it, it, you don't care. But if you're a Python programmer, you want something that feels comfortable for you. So, for instance, if you have a uh, a Python program that you're that you're using, you want to you know uh, add on to it, say f a parallel analysis layer, which is where I came at it from. You know, we had this this program called YT, and it operated very nicely in serial, and we wanted to be able to extend it in order to run on hundreds and and now thousands and tens of thousands of cores. And so, in order to do that, we needed some mechanism for parallel interoperation. And, you know, MPI is the obvious mechanism for doing this, and it was something we were comfortable with coming at it from the simulation side. Our simulation code you know, uses MPI for message passing, and so it was natural that we would want to use it uh, from within Python. And so we started out using MPI for Pi in its most, you know, trivial mechanism where it utilizes the, the or trivial from the user standpoint mechanism where it uses pickle to serialize objects and pass them between, uh, you know, different processors. And then we moved on to using it from the more advanced uh, standpoint of actually broadcasting arrays directly, you know, where it, where it takes the underlying memory buffer and then supplies that directly to MPI. Now, how many Python applications for MPI do you see? Because in some respects, in, in high-performance computing, people eschew everything that uh, detracts away from performance. And there certainly is the argument that a higher-level language like Python w won't give you that bare metal performance. Well, I guess it's interesting, right? Because what you're... What you're getting at here is this idea of of bare metal performance, and in a sense, yes. If you're if you're broadcasting around Python objects and you have to rely on the interpreter to go through and you know evaluate what a type of a given object is and how it how it's expressed to the underlying C code, then yeah, that can provide you know a number of barriers to performance. But that's not necessarily how it's exposed to MPI for Pi. Uh, for instance. MPI for Pi relies on on NumPy, and what NumPy is is essentially a a number of of shims that provide Python access to to fast underlying C arrays. And so, if you can broadcast those, or I'm sorry, if you can supply those arrays directly to MPI, rather than having to do any interpreted steps, it already knows the data type, and it can broadcast those around to different nodes, or it can send them, and it can use the underlying MPI machinery directly. Uh, I think I think you guys are interested in in some hard numbers, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So so you want to know uh, exactly uh, how bad uh, the performance uh, overhead is, and 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 how much it's affected uh, by going through Python. So uh, Lissandro ran uh, quite a series of extensive tests uh, on gigabit Ethernet, and I owe him some tests on on a BlueJean machine uh, just to to compare this. And uh, the way that we measured throughput is we have uh, three different ways that you, you could uh, write your MPI code, right? You could do it with just pure C. Uh, you could do it with NumPy uh, plus Python uh, plus MPI for Pi. Or you could just do uh, MPI for Pi's very native uh, technique. And uh, what you'll see is if you just use uh, C, of course, it's the fastest. But you're within a fraction uh, of 1% or 2%. Uh, as long as you're using the, the NumPy arrays beneath it. And, of course, the Pickle uh, interface is the slowest, but it turns out that it's uh, also uh, the most flexible and, and just requires the least amount of code and thought. Uh, and, and a final thing I'll say is that, of course, if you, you're doing this on shared memory, then you start seeing a, a performance hit due to just the Python overhead. And that can be as much as a factor of two, uh, but never worse than that, I would say. Yeah, what I was really going for there was the, the canonical argument that I've usually heard for doing MPI in higher level uh, languages is the abstraction win, that you can actually get more done in less time because you're not constrained so much by what C forces you to do with you know, primitive string handling and type handling and all these things. You can actually get more done even though it performs a little bit slower you can actually get your code written faster and get prototypes written faster and and things like that this is this kind of your experience as well uh certainly python is a more pleasant language to uh program in than than c and fortran um so so that's certainly one aspect of it uh the code tends to be a little bit more maintainable since uh there are less lines of code and uh, easier to debug and, and easier to, to see what's going on sometimes. So let's back up a moment. You mentioned uh, you're using NumPy, and NumPy is giving you all this performance with this. We've had NumPy on the show, and we've had um, 
it, they they would do a lot of work with Enthought kind of being a, a, a commercial face behind commercialized uh, support and things for Python. Do you guys have any relationship with Enthought? So uh, we neither I nor Matt have any official relationship with Enthought. For uh, a while, Enthought has been hosting the MPI for Pi and uh, the Petsy for Pi documentation, uh, but outside of that, not really. Okay, so then the actual MPI has multiple versions. You know, we have version, uh, I think. Two point something is the current standard one, and you know we're working on version three. What MPI spec does MPI for Pi currently aim to support? Oh, this is the best part about MPI for Pi is that it, it uh, freely supports both MPI one and two uh, specs. So uh, and Open MPI and MPI CH. So it doesn't matter what your underlying uh, MPI implementation is. Lissandro has hidden that. Uh, from uh, the user. All you have to do is write MPI code. Uh, now, if you write an MPI2 call and you have an open MPI implementation or an MPI implementation that doesn't support that MPI2 call, uh, you get a Python error at, at runtime and it says, oh, you, you couldn't do this. Um, but you're not limited. Uh, you know, you don't have to worry about that when you're writing the code. That's cool. Have you had a lot of issues with... Uh library support for the underlying MPI library providing your transport mechanism? Yeah, so, <laughs> Lissandro, <laughs> again... Uh, Go has, ahead, has, be honest. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 so, I would say that one of the most interesting problems that you deal with, uh, certainly with the older MPI implementations, is that there was no requirement uh, that MPI init uh, had to be called uh, sort of it had it had to be able to pass the command line arguments, and of course, if you're running the Python interpreter, those are long gone uh, by the time you import MPI for Pi. So uh, now in, in MPI two, this is a relaxed requirement, and, and sort of MPI in it is is not allowed to have access to the argc and argv anymore. Uh, but to to simplify and support MPI one implementations that still required that argc and argv. Uh, Lissandro has built a uh, MPI Python uh, interpreter, basically, and this is just a, a simple main. It, it grabs argc, argv, calls MPI in it, and then it starts the Python interpreter. So, if you're in a situation with a really old MPI, that's supported as well. This wow. is actually a wow. problem for me on uh, an older system where where we were using the SGI implementation, uh, and and uh, we ended up having to use the Python MPI interpreter quite often. Yeah. Yeah, and I will say there was actually a problem with OpenMPI for a while, too, because we open plugins and Python opens plugins, and the whole shared library interaction was actually quite a mess for a while until we figured out the way saying, no, you need to do it this way, some of the, the darker side of, of linkers, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but let me, uh, the next question, actually, after that little commentary, um, are your functions in MPI for Pi, are they bindings, meaning are they kind of one-to-one for the, the C functions, or are they a, a higher level, uh, you know, like a class library kind of approach? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question, because uh, there are actually two sets of bindings in uh, MPI for Pi. And so your traditional MPI bindings that you would call directly from C are available from Python as well, and those are the uppercase bindings. And I refer to the first letter of the Python MPI for Pi routines, and those look a lot like the C++ bindings, uh, in MPI2, though, they call directly into the C bindings themselves. They don't touch the C++ bindings. And uh, so com is an object, and so a communicator, uh, you can call functions on it like send, uh, receive, and broadcast. And all of those, if you call the uppercase versions, look exactly like the C signatures for uh, MPI. Now, in addition to those, there's a lower level set of calls that are implemented in lowercase. And those calls are uh, what I would call higher level or abstract or Python-like. And you can send any Python object over these things that can be serialized. And, and this is very friendly and very powerful. And this nice abstraction where uh, you don't worry about what you're doing. You just say, send this to process one. And MPI for Pi does all the work of packing it up and, and turning it into something that can be sent over the network. Do you see users when they're utilizing those kinds of, like, make it easy to send this thing 
engaging in communication patterns that are generally lower performance than using like collectives and such? Uh, I, I would say that, that most of the questions we get from users tend to be uh, really, really, how do I make this thing go? <laughs> the, the I can't import library uh, problems, really, really basic problems. We I, I think by the time people figure out how to use uh, Petsy or sorry MPI for Pi, uh, they're they know they know what they're doing between the two uh, sets of of calls. One of the very nice things about the way that uh, Lissandro has designed MPI for Pi is just how one to one mapping it is between the MPI uh, standard and the the function calls, except with this added twist, as as Aaron noted, of uh, Pythonic interface on top of that. So how do you guys handle types then? And, and um, I, I, I say that because MPI has this notion of data types, right? So like uh, in, in the C world, I have int and double and float and char and all these things. And I tell MPI what the type is because in C, it's the buffer is passed as a void star and, and MPI would have no other way of knowing. But in Python, you're much more strongly typed. How do you do the mapping, particularly for non-intrinsic data types? Okay, so uh, if you're uh, calling the the lowercase methods, this is this is what happens: is uh, there's a Python uh, module called pickle, and and what pickle does is it knows how to handle the serialization of all of the major Python uh, object types. So if you have a dictionary which looks like a hash map, or you have a list uh, which is uh, a C++ you know STL vector, if you're familiar with with the STL containers. All of these things are are instantly turned into uh, serialized objects, and so normally you might serialize something and, and put it in a file. But what we do is we serialize something and we put it in a buffer, and then that buffer, of course, is just a bunch of bytes. It's a bucket of bytes with a size, and uh, we send that over. And on the receiving side, the unpickle operation uh, reads the first few bytes of that, understands how it's going to decompress that, and then it turns it into an object on the same size. And all of this is sort of seamlessly handled by these lowercase methods. So I, I really just say com.send object and then the process I want to send it to and, Py, and MPI for Pi takes care of the rest. Gotcha. So there's really no notion of, of native or intrinsic types. Everything is serialized and, and unserialized? Uh, if it's something that you can turn into a numpy array, Obviously, it'll go a lot faster if you uh, turn it into an NumPy array first. And so MPI for Pi knows about what an MPI for, uh, NumPy array is. So it doesn't call uh, serialization on NumPy arrays. Uh, and also, if you use a PEP, uh, this is a Python enhancement proposal, 3118 buffer, this is also an object that M uh, MPI for Pi knows how to send efficiently. So as I said, a, num a NumPy array is really, or as Matt said, a NumPy array is really just a C buffer uh, of memory, and it could be a one or two or three-dimensional array and, and have strides and, and all of these things. Um, MPI for Pi knows how to take that and very efficiently send that using the native MPI uh, strides and any MPI data types for sending these things. So as an example, uh, if you use the, the uppercase, the functions, and you send a NumPy array using one of those, then they'll be broadcasted over, just as, as Jeff noted, with the void star, uh, if, they, if their strides match correctly and, and if they're able to be. Uh, and if you use the lowercase methods on even a complex derived type, for instance, you know, a, a Python class that's defined in your module, uh, it will serialize that in the way that Aaron described, pass it over, and it'll be deserialized on the receiving end. Cool. This, this is a really nice uh, hybrid approach to, to high-level and low-level programming using MPI in the sense that you can do really complex things using the, the pickle methods, but at the same time, you don't necessarily have to sacrifice the performance uh, for, for things that MPI natively understands. So this would require that, say I'm, a, I'm an application programmer, I would actually have to be programming in the, the, the numpy kind of style of my application itself. This isn't like a something under the covers that says like, I want to use the pickle driver, I want to use the numpy driver. I actually have to explicitly write everything and work with my arrays all in the numpy style. If Again, if you were trying to get uh, the maximum performance, uh, you would be working with numpy arrays. And, and generally for uh, numerical computing or scientific computing in Python, you're using numpy 
uh, anyway, because that's your matrix or vector storage for, for data. But if I've got a, an existing pile of Python that's like generic Python, doesn't import anything, and I wanted to start kind of hashing it around to make it work with this, I can just use Pickle and not even think about it and just go. You, you don't even need to, yeah, you don't need to use Pickle because MPI for Pi does that for you. And that's that's in the Python standard library, so it's it's available. That's right. You do from MPI for Pi, import MPI. You say com equals MPI.com world. And, uh, you know, you grab your com, uh, sorry, grab your size, grab your rank from the com, and uh, send the data. Right? Data equals com, broadcast. Data and uh, root equals zero. So one of the things that we added in MPI3 and actually is already available in the OpenMPI trunk is something called mProbe, matched probe. Um, it was to address a, a couple of things, and, and one of the rationale that was given was explicitly that it would be useful for higher-level languages um, where you might be sending um, you know, serialized data where you don't know the actual length of – the message that's going to be sent or, or to be received more specifically. And so it, it can be useful to just say, hey, just give me whatever the next message is and I, I want to receive it, but I, I don't know how long it's going to be. Um, so the matched probe, the idea is that you can say, hey, uh, give me this signature and, and not necessarily put in a length with it. And if you match it, that incoming message is removed from the matching queue so that nothing else can actually probe or receive mm -hmm. it, but you get a handle back to that message that you can then give to an M receive, matched receive, and say, okay, now actually receive it um, kind of thing. Now, uh, is this useful to, you know, MPI 4 Pi? Do you guys foresee being able to use this kind of functionality? Yeah, so that, that actually resolves one of the issues we have with, with, uh, with I receive. So, oh, uh, oh, thank God, because we <laughs> used you as a rationale. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the the way that we handle that now is we actually, if we have to, we send two messages, right? We, right. we send the size of the object ahead of time, and then the next message uh, is actually the data. Uh, yeah. When we don't, if if we, if we know we can avoid it, we just send one message. But uh, you, you're right. For safety, uh, we were often in that trap where we had to send two messages and. Uh, that's not just for point to point. Uh, in collective, sometimes we have these weird, uh, funny things as well. And, and let me say this again: you always have access to the C MPI functionality. Every single function in MPI is available to you from uh, the normal C bindings. What we occasionally cannot implement or we cannot do is give you a nice high-level Pythonic interface to some of these functions. Um, and a great example for uh, while we're going on this is MPI Reduce. Uh, and why is MPI reduce hard? MPI reduce is hard because you have to provide a reduce operand in the general case. And in Python, though we could maybe somehow uh, sneak a callback into a Python function uh, in the reduce call, what, what ends up happening or, or the current implementation just takes all of the data, uh, gathers it onto the root node, and then the reduce operation is applied on the root node. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the dirty under the covers MPI for Pi uh, trick to make things look more Pythonic, but it's certainly not the cleanest way to do it. And, and uh, of course, it doesn't scale. I'll be the first one to say I think Pythonic is a wonderful phrase. I'm going to work that into my daily vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> don't for, don't forget uh, a Pythonaut, right? Is somebody who is exploring <laughs> Python for the first time. Uh, I I would fall into that category. I would totally fall into that category. I'm sure you can tweet that somehow, Brock. <laughs> yeah. When when we write idiomatic Python, we are Pythonistas. And I'll stop there. <laughs> don't make me start busting out MPI puns because then it would get really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> we have all of Monty Python to fall back on, so <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Okay, so keep moving. Uh, you kind of mentioned some issues you had with uh, the SD, an old version of the SGI MPI library. What MPI implementations do you guys officially support, and which ones do you know work? Open MPI, MPI CH. Are there any other MPI implementations worth mentioning? 
<laughs> <laughs> I've also personally used it with uh, MVA pitch uh, with an older lamb. Uh, however, I must confess I have been unable to, or uh, uh, I have recently been using it with the Cray implementation as well, uh, and that has gone very nicely. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that we use it with the IBM implementation of, of MPICH, um, but I feel that, that most MPIs really are derivatives of one of those two. Mm -hmm. So do you find the interoperability between them that you do actually sit very nicely on top of MPI and are mostly isolated from differences? Yes, and, and some of that is, is due to a bit of leakiness. Uh, are you guys familiar with the Cython tool? One yeah. of our other guests mentioned it. Okay, so so Cython is is a, a Python package. It, it grew out of another package called Pyrex, and the idea was that well, Python is this slow interpreted language, and every once in a while we want to be able to compile a, a Python file basically into C, and so we add a little bit of uh, static uh, typing uh, to to a function, and uh, we, we force that uh, into the function file, and then we compile it with a C compiler with a little bit of interpreting. And in, in addition to that, we can also use Cython to generate interfaces. And, and so that's how MPI for Pi is built. It's built around a set of Cython interfaces uh, to the MPI uh, library, and it just basically takes the MPI.h header file and, and builds up a set of interfaces from there. So uh, why is this interesting or relevant? Well, if you're familiar with the internals of OpenMPI and MPI-CH, which you are, you'll know that communicators are different, uh, implemented differently. Uh, they, they're fundamentally different base types. And you would think that we needed to do something special to handle the fact that, well, it's an integer here and it's a pointer here. Uh, but Cython only needs a, an approximate type, it turns out. So even though uh, it, in some cases it's an integer and in some cases it's a pointer, uh, just saying, well, like, we think it's an integer is, is close enough, and, and things do work uh, smoothly between OpenMPI and MPI-CH. I, I can see you guys are horrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I, you know, as we talked before we start recording the show here, uh, I'm, I'm the Fortran uh, MPI guy. I, I don't know how I got sucked into that, but I am. And um, shall we say, in older versions of Fortran, types are a very fluid concept as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, even on platforms where integers and pointers are different sizes, right? The native int type is not the same size as a pointer. Uh, it still works. And it's because Cython only needs to sort of know uh, what type you're going to be interfacing with in C, and it does figure it out uh, when it actually does do the compile what it's supposed to be uh, converting the, the type to. So it works. So for upcoming things, I assume you guys are you know, going to implement MPI3 when that comes out? Yeah, I, I think that as soon as a MPI3 stable implementation is out, uh, there's certainly enough interest in, in MPI for Pi that uh, we'll be able to support that. And so what about any of these more Pythonic things? Do you have any Pi in the Sky ideas of future ways to make things more abstract, more higher level, easier for a grad student to get something running in parallel? I, I, I'm always full of ideas, and uh, I've, I've recently seen some people start working with uh, and building libraries on top of MPI for Pi to start uh, enabling uh, simple parallelism. Uh, I'm mostly interested in, in sort of uh, really high-level uh, utilities that sort of just uh, monitor, for example, uh, what's going on with a scientific application, uh, things like load. Uh, all of the things that are really dirty uh, from, from C or Fortran sometimes to, to incorporate or to cache or memoize or things like that uh, might be more interesting from Python. But uh, I, I don't think I have any hard ideas. So a question I like to ask people, uh, just because everybody has uh, different answers and different rationale for this, is what, uh, what version control system do you guys use for maintaining your code base and why? Uh, so Lissandra uses Mercurial, and Mercurial is uh, written in Python, Yay. and 
I don't, I don't actually have anything to say beyond that. I, I'm, I'm a Git guy myself. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I'm a Mercurial guy. Both of my other, uh, or I suppose the two main projects that I work on are also versioned in Mercurial. So <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, Skype high five Jeff on that one. <laughs> there you go. Woohoo! Um, that's just my personal opinion, but they're all, they're all good systems. The, uh, another question we like to ask is what's the strangest use that you have heard of with MPI 4 Pi? You know, something that you didn't necessarily intend or, or design it for, but you found out that some user is using it and you go, huh, well, that's kind of cool. Well, I think Aaron has a, uh, has kind of a hero run to describe, uh, uh, my understanding is that that Aaron runs on a tremendous number of cores uh, with MPI for Pi. Uh, Sixty-five thousand tremendous. Yes, I, I, I think that's I think that's uh, not even in in the ballpark for amazing these days, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, we we cool. uh, I would say that we've exposed uh, the the dirty dirty underbelly of uh, parallel file systems with uh, dynamic loading. And, oh yes. Uh, I don't know how, how interesting or exciting this is uh, to report negative or, or scary negative results, but uh, bringing in Python, importing NumPy, and importing MPI for Pi on uh, most or every supercomputing class uh, machine that we've tried so far uh, takes several hours. Oh, because that's a file operation at runtime. Oh, yeah, sweet. Runtime. Yeah. It's many Small file operations at runtime. Parallel FSs. Yeah. Well, one of, we the, actually, one of the problems with the import is is really how many directories and files it needs to touch during the import process on all of the different right. processors simultaneously. Right. So it, so it puts tremendous load on the, the metadata server usually. That's right. And so what you're seeing is 65,000 processors doing a search over uh, the standard DL open routine uh, for all the paths over all the libraries. And on top of that, Python itself is also searching for every module and every package it needs to load. And uh, we have some good news, and uh, that's that Asher Langton, who's a, I think he's a graduate student uh, doing a research appointment at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, has, has a very nice implementation that's trying to fix this by, by simply uh, letting only process zero do the search, and then reporting the results uh, to the remaining processes. Of course, this doesn't help DL open, and uh, that's where Jed Brown and I uh, have been working on trying to figure out uh, how to intercept, and we're all the way in glibc uh, at its, its very base uh, bootstrapping uh, uh, set to uh, intercept these file system calls and, and do something smarter with them. Cool. Yeah, we. I think we have a smaller version of that problem in OpenMPI because you know we're all about the plugins, and we have several dozen plugins. And at larger scale, we were actually requested way back in the early beginnings of OpenMPI say, "Hey, give us a way to not make these plugins so that they're just part of you know libmpi dot a instead, so that I don't have a bajillion DL opens going on at the same time, but probably fewer than." Uh, Python and searching and things like that. But yeah, similar issue. It's always cool to bring out these uh, things that people just never thought of until you start running them at tens of thousands of cores. Well, thanks a lot for your time, guys. Um, what is the MPI for Pi website where people can download it and how can they get involved? Uh, it's at uh, code.google.com uh, forward slash p forward slash MPI for Pi. And of course, we're always looking for people to contribute, uh, especially with these Pythonic uh, routines. Uh, take a look at it. If you see something that you like or something that's interesting, uh, send us an email. Uh, there's an MPI for Pi developers list on Google Groups, and of course, we're very chatty and, and friendly. Okay, well, thanks again. Oh, thank you guys. Appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Jeff and Brock. Okay, and we're done.